So I might be in the minority when I say this. And at the end of the video, I still probably will be. But I truly believe Generation 7, which is Pokemon Sun and Moon slash Ultra Sun and Moon, are underrated in the quote-unquote new era of Pokemon games. And by new, I mean Generation 6 and beyond. Why is that? Well, five years ago, I clearly remember myself pulling up to a local GameStop nearby the university I was working at at the time being. Uh, it was a midnight release, so I had to wake my ass up like at 11, 11.59 p.m., whatever, and it was literally like a five-minute drive to the GameStop. And I remember seeing a lot of people actually at this at the uh, you know midnight release, a lot more than I expected. Probably because after all the information that Pokemon was releasing at the time and all the data mining that was occurring, people were pretty excited for these games. Um, I think this is where Pokemon truly decided to take a, a hopeful step in the right direction. A change was needed in the franchise. This was the first time that we had no gym leaders in a mainline Pokemon game. Instead, we have four island trial captains. Or island kahunas. I believe that's what's called in the in the game um it was not a conventional traditional pokemon game of course not it had new pokemon it had new mechanics but the structure was changing and people were wondering whether or not pokemon were making it or making the right move in regards to making such changes in today's video i'm going to explain why generation 7 is underrated and why its flaws prevents it from being appreciated by the people, by the fans, those who enjoy playing Pokemon. Let's start off. First, the region. Like I mentioned, there's four islands and the Aether Foundation, I don't really call it an island, more of a conservatory island, quote unquote. Pokepelago, which is accessed, you know, it's just accessed through the bottom screen. And then you've had in Ultra Sun and Moon, the addition of Mega Megapolis, and obviously the, your way to fight Necrozma's final form. In the original iterations of Sun and Moon, the games themselves were pretty good. It had a nice story. Z moves at the time were pretty cool concept. Uh, character designs were pretty good too. It checked off the pretty concept boxes of whether or not this was going to be a good Pokemon game. It was actually was a good Pokemon game. There was actually a couple twists in the story. And I've always been a critical guy when it comes to Pokemon stories. Yeah, we don't really play the games to play the story. We don't play the stories to play the actual game. But the story in this was pretty good. And I remember making a video last year in regards to why Lusamine was a really great villain in the Pokemon universe. And part of it was because of the story surrounding by her kids, Lily and Gladian, and her quest of her quest and her obsession of bringing her husband back who was lost in the wormholes because of the ultra beasts. Um it was actually good story writing. Really good. Uh, obviously, you know, when we talk about stories and character development, we always look up to Generation 5. Generation 5 had the best storytelling, had the best characters, had a best atmosphere, best background for cultivating a marvelous story. And in Generation 7, they somehow, I wouldn't say it was on par with Generation 5, but it was up there. It was actually really good. The way you see Lily and Gladian develop over time, the way you start finding out that Team Skull, they're not the real bad guys. It was Lusamine and her Aether Foundation. Which you could have you could have probably sensed it from the beginning of the game, but it was a good job on Pokemon's part to keep that hidden as a plot as a plot twist. And then you actually fight an um, Ultra Beast infused with Lusamine herself, which is kind of crazy. I don't can't recall any Pokemon game that has done that fusion of Pokemon and human, unless you consider Bill from Generation One when he basically was a talking Clefairy. <laughs> but overall the story was pretty good. Um your rival, how? I don't know if he's really considered a rival. He's more of a friend. He wants you to battle, but he's not really 
a rival to you. And this is where it, it starts becoming a trend that our rivals aren't really rivals. They're just there to make sure that you have good Pokemon, make sure you have items. I think this is where it started, where the rival archetype in Pokemon just this is too friendly. I think that's one of the flaws. That how itself, while his character presence was good, his motivation, his reasoning to being a rival was not that great. And that was, I think that was one of the biggest criticisms of these generation of games. The rivals start becoming too friendly. We miss the Garys. We miss the, we miss Silver. Those days where the rivals didn't give a shit about you. They wanted to beat you badly. They wanted to be better than you. And you had to prove to them why. I think this generation proved that the, ri the, the rival characterization just didn't pan out very well. By the way, before we go on to the other topics, the island settings in Ultra Sun and Moon and Sun and Moon is pretty good. The artistic styles is really good. Uh, the way they were advertising this game, it, it looked pretty damn good. And it kind of lived up to expectation. The environment was great, although, be it, you know, when you're on the first island, it took a really damn long freaking time. Because, you know, holding hands scenario in Pokemon, always been notoriously way too long. I guess the first island, to me personally, was a bit too much as well. Um, they didn't really fix it with Ultra Sun and Moon, and we're going to get to Ultra Sun and Moon. Um, but yeah, Pokemon was good. Next up we have is the mechanic that somehow made things a little more broken than it should be, or Z-moves. Every typing had a Z-moves. Certain Pokemon had special Z-moves. For example, Como and Ultra Sun and Moon got Komonium Z. Uh, Mew got Mewium Z. More Shadow got more Shadium Z. Uh, Snorlax. Uh, Pikachu, they all got their own Z-moves. The problem with me, when I, the problem that I have with Z-moves is that once it's used on a Pokemon, for example, let's say a Landris. A Landris versus a Tangrowth. Tangrowth obviously is a grass type and Landris is a ground and flying. Now obviously you would think, hell, Landris only knows one flying type move and that is fly. <laughs> And so it, if it doesn't have fly, it has no business in dealing with a Tangrowth. But what happens if you give it a Flyium Z? Now that Landris is able to take out a Tangrowth without any problem. And I think that's the problem with Z-moves. Z-moves were great in a sense that the Pokemon can overcome its checks or encounters. But that's also a problem in itself. If a Pokemon is able, a Pokemon has no business in dealing. If a Fire-type has a Z-move that can beat a Water-type, can beat its check and counter without any problems. That's a problem in a microscopic level. Certain Z-moves, for those who, who played this generation of games, either gives you a tremendous amount of power or gives you a crazy amount of boosts. EVMZ was the Z-move that you can use on EV gave it plus two stats in everything. That's a little too much, isn't it? You have Commonium Z gives you plus six. Mirium Z gives you a nuke. Marshadow gives you a nuke. Um, status moves, depending on what it is, can give you special boost. It can give you a plus speed, plus special defense. It can give you additional effects outside. For example, I believe Stealth Rock. If you use Z Stealth Rock, it gives you Stealth Rocks, and I believe it was another a boost in 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 stat. Overall, I think Z moves were okay. I do think it kind of put a lot of Pokemon over the edge. It pushed them way beyond what they were supposed to implement with Z moves. Good concept, but we kind of missed new Megas, and Megas were in this game. I forgot as well. Megas made a return in this generation of games, and. Megas alongside a user that had a Z-Moves. Wow, you're just talking about nukes everywhere. A little iffy on Z-Moves. Next up we have are the Pokemon. And by looking at this image, man, there was just not a lot of new Pokemon, was there? I'm pretty sure there was less than 100. But I'm not here to count, though. Um, 
I believe it was less than 100. I think it was around 80 because the Pokedex started at 7... I want to say it was 722. Yeah, I think it was like about 80 new Pokemon that were introduced in... A little more over 80 that were introduced. Good amount of Pokemon. Uh, we had Decidueye, Incineroar, and we have Primarina as our starters, Evolutions. Pretty good. I would say these designs, if you're comparing them to other generations, were pretty damn good. You had the Lycanroc family. You had the regional bird, which was eh. You had Donald Trump, who was a Pokemon, which is pretty funny. Um, you had a lot of interesting Pokemon here. We had Pokemon with unique abilities, such as Halazzle, which can poison poison, poison types and steel types, which is insane. Um, you also had Mudsdale, who had a really interesting uh, stamina ability. You had Schooling. You've had um, Como, -O, which was a interesting pseudo, pseudo Pokemon, pseudo legendary Pokemon. Um, Dragon and Fighting. Imagine in a world where fairies didn't exist. This thing would be broken. And then we have the Pokemon that shined in this generation's metagames, which were the Tapus. And you had Ultra Beasts, the Box Cover Legends, Magearna, and Marshadow. Marshadow was released, I believe, officially July 2017. And it, in certain unofficial metagames like Smogon OU, it was banned within days because it was so broken. Formosa, fragile, but yet it was like Deoxys attack. It just was crazy. Celestia, fat annoying piece of shit. Cartana hits hard. Buzzwell hits hard. Hilego kind of does its job. The Tapus, the four Tapus, were incredible in their own right. I believe right off the bat, Tapu Lele and Tapu Coco were really good on offensive builds. Tapu Fini was great. Water and Fairy. Something that it shares with Primarina. It's a great defensive typing. Then you had Tapu Bulu, which was great because they can give you Earthquake support. Meaning that your Pokemon can't get hit by that much by Earthquakes. And Grass and Fairy was interesting as well. Overall, the Pokemon in this metagame were decent. Nothing was bad about it. Except for this annoying piece of shit that is Toxapex. But other than that, the, the, the metagame was great. We had new Pokemon. Pokemon actually did their thing. Obviously, you know, there are specific Pokemon that we don't care about. There's other Pokemon that are great, like Mimikyu. Mimikyu was really good in offense. You had Golisopod, which was a very interesting Pokemon. Uh, you had um, Silvali, which gives you the, you know, depending on the, on the memory disk that you give it. it has its corresponding typing. Later on, we had um, Ribambi, which allowed us to set up hazards. Phenomenal. I think uh, overall, the Pokemon was great. I can't really say too much about the Pokemon. Um, it was a good, good selective group of Pokemon. Balanced. Like, yes, there was kind of somewhat bad Pokemon, but at the same time, it was, they were pretty damn good at the, what they were doing. And I think this is where we talk about the biggest flaw. The biggest flaw in this generation, or the biggest problem that I had, was the fact that we ended up getting enhanced, quote-unquote, quote-unquote enhanced copies of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. I feel like instead of these being $40 games, they should this should have been $5 DLC. That will always be my opinion, and I will stick with it to the very end. I do believe that the biggest problems in Sun and Moon is that I felt like there are certain portions of the game where it was just not finished. Necrozma ended up, in the regular Sun and Moon iterations, ended up being a forgettable legendary. Think about it. Think about what happened to Zygarde with Pokemon X and Y. It was for, it was forgotten. It's almost as if the developers seemed to like, okay, let's put this Pokemon in here, and that's it. It wasn't like the times where we had a storyline with Rayquaza, the third legendary in the third generation. It wasn't the case for Giratina until it Pokemon Platinum. It wasn't the case with Hiram until Black 2, White 2. X and Y, Zygarde was forgotten. Oras. Rayquaza had its own freaking Delta episode. X and Y, Zygarde was completely forgotten. In this generation, 
uh, without Ultra Sun and Moon, that Crozen was forgotten. And I guess that might have been part of their motivation into creating Ultra Sun and Moon. To in, in, integrate Necrozma into the main story. And now be it Ultra Sun and Moon. Yes, I did buy Ultra Sun um, in this case. And I, when I played it, I had a feeling that I couldn't really, I couldn't really enjoy this story. Because I already played the same story. It's literally the same story outside of the new Necrozma storyline. That's it. This could have been $5 DLC. This could have been a time where Game Freak's like, you know what? We should be making DLC. Because eventually, with Sword and Shield, they ended up getting DLC. But at this time, we're still on the 3DS. Um, the games ran good on 3DS outside of a couple, you know, frame drops because of multiple Pokemon. You know, and double battles and whatnot. But it was okay. Um, Wi-Fi battles were pretty good. One hour timer battles. Remember those days? Um, I liked battling. And this is where I first entered. I think this was the first generation where I truly played in Pokemon Showdown as well. Battling was great. Of course, when you're in a metagame for about three years, which was the time these games were released all the way to Sword and Shield, the metagame got quite stale. But I'm not really here to discuss about that. I have my own opinions on these metagames. But. I think the biggest flaw in the seventh generation was the fact that we ended up getting two quote unquote sister games for four dollars a piece, which was ridiculous. This should have been DLC. Um, I feel like they've still didn't address the biggest problems with the game. The game felt like there was a lot to do. You know, from the game standpoint, there's places you can explore, but the problem is it felt empty. Remember the supposed dream park? You know, the little park in one of the islands where they were trying to essentially um, continue building it. Supposedly in Ultra Sun and Moon, where it was supposed to be kind of like... Uh, supposed to be kind of like the dream world from Generation 5. I, I'm, forgive me if I'm not mistaken, where you can find hidden abilities in Pokemon. That could have been really great in these games. Another thing is that I feel like we should have had access to more islands instead of features. Yes, we got the Rotom O powers in this game, but the problem is, why give us features when you can literally open up islands, islands to explore? And obviously one of the biggest additions they had was Ultra Space. Ultra Space wormholes where you can go hunt all the legendaries in their own respective places and other Pokemon as well. The game itself was good, but its execution was poor because why do I got to do all this to even hunt for Ultra Beasts? Give us a storyline with the Ultra Beasts. They just show up and attack Alola. Okay, so what? Let us understand the origin backgrounds of Ultra Beasts. Where did they come from? The Pokedexes and the worlds that the, you can find the Ultra Beasts in, they're very unique. I like that. I like the uniqueness of instead of finding them in a Hoopa ring or in a wormhole where you can find, you know, countless legendary Pokemon, these Ultra Beasts got specific worlds. It was nice to see Buzzwool. It was nice to see Nihilego. It was nice to see Kartana in their own unique environments. However, I want a story behind it. Who are these Ultra Beasts? What are they? Where do they come from? If we're literally traveling to their worlds, how? How do they do that? And I guess the best example is Guzzlord. Where do you find Guzzlord? Guzzlord apparently is in a place where you see the first city that you encounter in Sun and Moon destroyed. And there's context clues in the area that can tell you, hey, yo, this is kind of creepy. I love that kind of stuff. I love to see the stuff, that kind of stuff in Pokemon where... Where, where's the Pokemon's origins? It seemed as if Guzzlord came from a different dimension because, or a different alternate reality. Because the first city that you encounter, uh, I can't really pronounce it. It's Howley, Howley City. Forgive me if I mispronounced that. It seemed as if Guzzlord destroyed that city. It ate everything in sight. That's cool. I love that. Unfortunately, the games were not cool. The games were just an, another incentive to just 
be a crash grab rather than being a enhanced versions of a story that was pretty good. Instead, we found ourselves playing a repetitive story. We found ourselves wanting, still wanting more, even after the Necrozma um, storyline. We ended up getting move tutors, which was good. But again, the features are nice. Unfortunately, the story and the reason why we should buy these games wasn't. Essentially, was a cash grab. And then last but not least, we have the anime. I think the anime was actually good. The first iteration of Sun and Moon, the regular Sun and Moon, was really good. And I believe Ultra Legends was decent. I didn't really get to see Ultra Avengers. But I remember that the biggest criticism from the anime was the design. The art. A lot of people complain about the art. I mean, if you take a, a, a series back, we had Pokemon X and Y. X and Y was phenomenal. It was great. Arguably one of the best anime series in Pokemon history. And then they transitioned from that to this, and people were definitely complaining about this. Now, obviously, I watched the original Pokemon series when it came out in Japan. Um, it was good. It was good. Um, do I recommend watching it? I would probably recommend maybe the first seasons or series. Um, Ultra Legends, I believe it's okay, and I don't know about Ultra Adventures. I don't. I didn't really watch much of it. At this point in time, I kind of like lost my interest in Pokemon because, again, these games were in circulation for about three years. So anyways, guys, that's my opinion on Generation 7. I said a lot of good things about this. What a miracle, huh? I've always been the one to complain about Pokemon and Game Freak and how they've handled the franchise lately. But overall, I think Generation 7, while it did have its flaws, the integral parts, the story, the Pokemon, the region, the features the mechanics. It was good. Let me know what you guys think. It's your boy Franklin, signing out. Peace.